نحمده و نستعینه و نستغفره و نعوذ بالله من شرور انفسنا و من سیئات اعمالنا من يحده الله فلا مدل له و من يدلل فلا حادي له و اشهد و لا اله الا الله وحده لا شريك له و اشهد ان محمدا عبده و رسوله Indeed, our praise and glory belongs to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We praise Him. We seek His aid and His forgiveness. We seek refuge with Allah from the evils inside of us and from our evil actions. Whomsoever Allah guides, none can lead astray. And whomsoever Allah leaves astray, none can guide. I testify that none has the right to be worshipped but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He is one and he has no partners. And I testify that Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is his servant and final messenger to the whole of mankind. My respected brothers and sisters in Islam, humanity needs a role model. Humanity needs a guide. And the guide of humanity is, of course, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. But after the prophets, the next best guides, role models and examples for us are the Sahaba or the companions of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. We know this from the authentic hadith where the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, the best generation are my generation than those that came after them and those that came after them. So the best generation are the people around Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And of course they would be. They were there when Quran was being sent down. Their teacher was Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. They lived the seerah. We, we read the seerah. We look at these incidents. They lived the seerah. They were the best of the people. And amongst the best of the Sahaba was of course Abu Bakr radiyallahu anhu. So in today's khutbah, we are going to look at some instances which makes him the greatest of the Sahaba. What is it that makes him so great and what are the lessons that we can derive from the life of Abu Bakr radiyallahu anhu. So we begin first of all by noting something. That he comes from a small tribe of Mecca. So Quraysh is made up of sub-tribes, smaller tribes. Some of them are very big. Bani Makhzum, Bani Umayyah, these are the big tribes. Bani Hashim, these are the big tribes. Then there are certain small tribes. Banu Taim is a small tribe. Abu Bakr is from this small tribe. But he is one of the leaders. He is very eloquent. He is very trustworthy. He is a businessman. He has got a great position in society. This is important. Hold on to that because when we talk about dawah, these characteristics are so important. So we continue with Abu Bakr. Next, we learn about him that even before when the prophethood of Rasulullah came and he became a Muslim, even before that, he led a good life. He was a good individual. This is important. Even before Islam, he was a very good individual. It was authentically reported. He never prostrated to an idol. He never drank alcohol. So these are the vices of society. He never participated. He was of the pure fitrah. And this is important because of the hadith of the Prophet where he said, the people are like mines of gold and silver. Those that are best before Islam will be best after Islam as long as they have good Islamic knowledge. So he was amongst the best before Islam and you will see, no doubt, he was amongst the best after Islam. This is important. And the lesson we learn from this is that not all non-Muslims are the same. Some are better than the others. Some are more aligned to Islam. Some are more aligned to our causes like Gaza. Some of their hearts are softer. Work on them. Be with them. Be closer. Don't abandon them. Because those that will, maybe they will one day enter into Islam. Similarly, negligent Muslim. Someone who is not fulfilling the commands of Allah. May Allah guide him or her. Don't write them off. Especially if they are sincere, they want to, they have got a good respect of the religion, but there is weakness in their practice, don't write people off. Because those that were good, they will be good later on inshallah. So we need to be like that in our, in our behavior. 
The second thing to learn about Abu Bakr, very uh, uh, special quality, he was a close friend of Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. So their relationship did not begin with Islam, did not begin with the Nabuwat, the prophethood of the. They were friends before that. This is important. And the lesson we learn: the Hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, a person will follow the religion of a close friend. So choose your friends carefully. This is the lesson we derive from that he was a close friend of Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam this obviously impacts when he takes the shahada but he was a close friend so the lesson we learn choose your friends and very importantly the friends of your children very very carefully it has a huge impact this is the next lesson the next thing that we learn and it's a beautiful thing about how and when he accepted Islam because there is a uniqueness about him. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, Whenever I presented Islam to anyone, they paused, they hesitated, except Abu Bakr. He immediately accepted Islam. He didn't pause and he didn't hesitate. This is amazing. But, but, but so, and don't be critical of the others that they pause. Don't be critical of them. Think about it. Because all of a sudden, somebody comes to you, i.e. Muhammad وسلم, and he's truthful, he's a good man, but he says to you, everything that you've grown, all of your beliefs are falsehood. He says to you, all of your value systems are wrong. He says to you, I am a messenger of God. And you know by implication, if you follow him, your entire life is going to change. Aren't you going to pause and think? Aren't you going to deliberate? Yes, you are. And they all did except Abu Bakr. This is his status. This is, and the, and the Prophet, the Prophet Sassam, he appreciated that. He appreciated. This is a unique characteristic, a unique behavior of Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu. We move on. And so now he becomes a Muslim immediately and we see of some of the things that make him exclusive. And there are many things that make him exclusive. One of those things is his spending in the path of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And in the early days, he was known for spending on slaves. Because when Quraysh, they found out about the Muslims, the fledgling Muslims, they were punishing and they were torturing people, but your torture depends on your rank. If you've got a big tribe and you're rich, they're gonna to torture you less. But if you're a slave, you've got no one to protect you, they're gonna to torture you even to death. Abu Bakr would go and he would free as many slaves as he could, as many slaves. And he was known for that. All of his wealth would go, and who was the famous slave that he, that he freed? Bilal radiallahu And This is a famous one as we know, but he was known for his freeing of the slaves. And why was he doing it? Because his father, Abu Kahafa, said to him, look, Abu Bakr, my son, you're freeing these slaves, free the strong ones. The ones that when you get into trouble, they've got your back. Because you free them, they're with you now. So free the strong ones, not the weak. He's going around freeing all the weak ones, the women, the poorest, the ones right at the bottom end. Abu Bakr is freeing them. And Abu Bakr says, no, I'm doing it only seeking the pleasure of Allah. I'm not seeking so they have my back later on. I'm doing it only for Allah. And his ikhlas is so much, Allah sends Quran down about this incident. Yeah, this is important. His ikhlas, his sincerity is so much, Allah sends Quran down. A'udhu billahi minash shaitan rajim bismillahi rahman rahim Wa ma li ahadin indahu min ni'matin tujza illa abtigha a wajhi rabbihi al-a'la wa la sawfa yarda Meaning he didn't do it seeking the pleasure of anyone. He did it seeking the face or the pleasure of Allah, truly he will be pleased. Meaning he will enter into Jannah. So his ikhlas in this matter was so much in Surah Al-Layl, Allah sends Quran down about the ikhlas and the action of Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu. So this is the lesson. When you give, give it seeking the pleasure of Allah. Not seeking the thanks of the people. Not seeking, I did you have something, you give my faith. No, you do it seeking the pleasure of Allah. And this was Abu Bakr. Sticking with his spending. So he gave, but he gave so much. So there's an incident with the Prophet Sallallahu he says to his Sahaba, we're going, there's a battle, come give. 
So Umar says, today I'm going to be tops. I'm going to beat everyone. I'm going to beat Abu Bakr. So Umar bin Khattab comes and he gives so much in front of the feet of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Whatever wealth he's got, he puts there. And Rasul is concerned. He says to him, what have you left for your family? He says, I've left half for my family. So half for Allah and his Rasul and half for his family. So I said, fine, alhamdulillah, no problem. Abu Bakr comes. He puts everything in front of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi And imagine, imagine emptying your entire house out and emptying, obviously one bank account say, emptying your entire wealth out, putting it at the feet of Rasulullah. Rasulullah says, says, what have you left for your children? Rasulullah is caring, he's worried. What have you left for his children? I have left Allah and his Rasul for my family. Iman, Iman, mind, these people, they did it. We talk, they did, he actually did that. Gave everything to Rasulullah. And so later on, the Prophet, the most appreciative of people says, no one's wealth helped me like the wealth of Abu Bakr. So I appreciate it. No one's wealth benefited me like the wealth of Abu Bakr. Abu Bakr starts to cry. He says, Ya Rasulullah, what is my life and my wealth except for you? This is it. And, and he means it. And let's come on to that. Which is his love for Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So this is the next point. Having love for Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And it's so important. Listen, learn about his love. So, as we go through the Meccan stage, Quraysh becomes stronger. They become bolder. And so they start to attack the leaders of the Muslims as well. And one day the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is in the precincts of the Kaaba. And the Quraysh come and they start to attack him. And the worst of them, Uqba bin Abi Muayt, he gets like a cloth and he's literally strangling Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. It's unprecedented, literally strangling him. Sahaba are there, they can't do anything. They can't do anything except Abu Bakr. Remember, Abu Bakr charges in and says, would you kill a man? Because he says, my Lord is Allah. So Abu Bakr confronts them in the precincts of the Kaaba. They turn around and they start attacking him. And they beat him so much, so much, literally he's on Doors' death. So his tribe says, if he dies, we're going to take revenge. So imagine they have literally beaten him to death. This was his love for Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa They take him home. His mother looks after him. Soon as he comes round, one sentence on his mouth. How is Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? Imagine, not anything about himself, nothing matters. How is? And until they take him, until he sees Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, there is no peace in his heart. This is love for Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Another beautiful incident. The hijra is taking place. All the Muslims have left. There's only a couple left, a handful left. And the Prophet ﷺ is one of them. One day he goes to the house of Abu Bakr. And it's like the hottest time of the day. Nobody comes to the house that day. He comes, he sits with the Prophet, he sits with Abu Bakr, a couple of people there. And he says to Abu Bakr that we're going to do hijra and you are coming with me. And Abu Bakr is the happiest person in the world. And imagine, what does this mean? The Prophet ﷺ is a wanted man. All of Quraysh are going to try and attack him and kill him. This is the most dangerous journey from Mecca to Medina. All of Quraysh are going to attack. So whoever goes with the Prophet, his life is in mortal danger. Who wants it? Most of the Sahaba have gone. Whoever goes with him, his life is in danger. Aisha says, radiallahu anha, I never knew anybody could cry out of happiness until I saw Abu Bakr cry on that day. <laughs> he is so happy, he is going with Rasulullah on a journey that could cost him his life, but he is so happy, he is crying tears of happiness. This is love. This is love for Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. This is what we need to lesson, we need to inculcate, we need to take this love into our lives. We move on. And we see that Abu Bakr is the first. Why? He's at the first of everything. He's not happy like we are. We do our five times salah, alhamdulillah, we've made it, we're there. No. He wants to be the best at everything. This, this, the, our, this deen religion is a way of life. He lives Islam as a way of life. And let's explain that. In a hadith of the Prophet 
He's describing the gates of Jannah. So this is the gate of Salah. Whoever excels in Salah will go through this gate. This is the gate of Sadaqah. This is when we call Babu Rayan, the gate of fasting. So these are the gates. And Abu Bakr says, whoever enters through all of these gates will truly be successful. Ya Rasulullah, will anyone enter through every gate? <laughs> Me and you, as long as we get through any gate into Jannah, Alhamdulillah. Abu Bakr, no. I, I want my name to be called from every gate. Rasulullah says, yes, and I hope it is you, Ya Abu Bakr. And if Rasulullah hopes for something, it is Abu Bakr. So this is the rank of Abu Bakr. He excels in everything. So those mundane routine things, he excels. In another instance, the Prophet ﷺ is here, Sahaba, he says, who amongst you woke up fasting? Abu Bakr. He says, who amongst you followed a janaza? Abu Bakr. Who amongst you fed a poor person? Abu Bakr. Who amongst you visited a sick? Abu Bakr. In everything he said, Abu Bakr. And these are all things every one of us can do. We can fast, we can follow janazah, we can, we can go to the ill, we can give to the poor. None of the Sahaba fulfilled all the categories except for Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu. The Prophet said no, these characters aren't combined except this is a person of Jannah. This was Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu. And we close the first khutbah by understanding he is given a title. He is a Siddiq, the truthful. Why is he a Siddiq? Why is he, why is he the truthful? We covered part of it, remember? When at the beginning, right at the beginning, he accepted Islam immediately. This was his truthfulness. But the real reason he's given this title is because of the journey of Al-Isra wal Miraj. So we know this is the famous journey where the Prophet ﷺ in a single night is taken from Mecca to Masjid Al-Aqsa in Jerusalem. He leads all the prophets in Salah. He goes with Jibreel on Burak through the heavens, passing by the prophets. He sees Jannah, he sees Jahannam. He speaks to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and he comes back. He goes to Makkah and he tells the people there. So Rasulullah tells everyone and Abu Jahal is sitting there. And normally the Quraysh, the disbelievers, whenever the Prophet says something, they put their fingers in the air. They don't want to hear. But Abu Jahal hears this. Abu Jahal says, repeat what you do. Abu Jahal says, listen, if I call the people, will you say that again, that one night you went from here to Masjid Al-Aqsa, you led the prophets, you passed the prophets, you went to the heavens, you sought Jannah, you sought Jannah, you spoke, will you say that? Meaning, no one's going to believe you. And if you say that, people will leave Islam because this is just, no one's going to accept that. Abu Rasul said, yeah, of course I will say it. He goes, then someone goes to Abu Bakr and says, Abu Bakr, this is what your friend said. Abu Bakr says to them, did he really say that? Meaning, most of Quraysh, they lie all the time. They just, they, did he really say that? The man says, yes. Abu Bakr says, if he said that, I believe him. Truly, he comes and he's given revelation from the heavens. This is why he is a Siddiq. When again, many of the companions, they hesitated, they paused, they needed time. Some even left Islam. Immediately, a Siddiq of this Ummah says, I believe. This is why he is the truthful of this Ummah. So this is again our lesson. We should be of those we hear and we obey. We hear and we obey. أقول قول هذا وأستغفر الله لي ولكم فاستغفر إنه الغفور الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين الصلاة والسلام على رسول الكريم. So in the second khutbah. We just look at a couple of points which shows Abu Bakr as a leader in his own right. When does he truly become a leader? After the passing away of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So let's pick up. 
The death of the Prophet وسلم, happens and this is really, it's narrated the darkest day in Medina. If the best day was when Rasulullah arrived, the darkest day was the death of Rasulullah Imagine, no more Quran is going to be revealed. Imagine the Prophet of Allah who you saw every single day, who you heard, who you had around you, he's no there anymore. You thought you were going to conquer the world with a Prophet, now your Prophet has gone. There is there is mayhem in Medina. This is no exaggeration. There is mayhem in Medina. The senior Sahaba are crumbling. Umar bin Khattab, you know, next after Abu Bakr, the, the man of the moment, the most calmest, Umar bin Khattab, these are strong. What does he do? He goes around saying, no. He's left like Musa Ali he's going to come back. Anyone who says he's dead, he's a munafik. Anyone who says he's dead, I'm going to chop his head off. He's wandering around with a sword. Senior Sahaba, no one knows what to do. The messenger has gone. Except for one man, Abu Bakr. <laughs> Abu Bakr is not there. He comes in past all of this crisis. He doesn't speak to anyone. The first thing he does, he goes to the body of his beloved and he uncovers his face and he kisses Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa The first thing, forget the commotion, forget the noise. Where's my Habib? Where's my beloved? He kisses Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa He says, you are as beautiful in death as you are in life. Truly, you will only taste a death's one. So this is his love, his attachment. Then he goes into Medina, sorry, into the Masjid of the Prophet. He tells Umar, be quiet, sit down. He doesn't carry on. Everyone crowds round Abu Bakr. He's the man of the moment. He says, whoever worships Muhammad, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, know that Muhammad is dead. And whoever worships Allah, know that Allah is the ever living. When he said that, people say the ayat of Isa, the first time we like hear this and the whole of Medina, they calm down. They received composure. He was the man of the crisis. He stabilized the ummah in its single most dangerous moment. This was Abu Bakr radiallahu and this is Abu Bakr, this was his status. Remember senior Umar bin Khattab, Uthman Ali, Abu Bakr is there, calming. This is leadership. So the lesson we take, leadership is shown in a crisis. When things aren't going right at home, when things aren't going right at work, when things aren't going right at the ummah, how do you behave? Are you a leader like Abu Bakr? He was a leader. And then other things happen, you know, crises are going to play, people are not paying zakat, this one's saying I'm a false prophet. All of these things, Abu Bakr stems. He, you know, in Umar bin Khattab, the Ummah it expands across many different lands. Abu Bakr gets it ready. There's two years he gets the, uh, it ready. We're not going to spend time, but he was amongst the greatest of the leaders. But we close with just one thing. We close with, again, the life, the, the simple things of Abu Bakr. Just one last one. This is about Abu Bakr. Now he's a Khalifa. So you, now you can be thinking, he's a Khalifa. Forget those small things about visiting the ill and feeding the one. But forget that. He's Abu Bakr. He's a Khalifa now. He's different like the rulers are. Listen to Abu Bakr. Umar bin Khattab, he's always watching Abu Bakr. He says, every morning after Fajr, I see Abu Bakr leaving the masjid and he goes deep into the deserts of Medina and he comes back hours later when the sun is at its highest. I need to know what's going on. What's he doing? So Abu Bakr, so Umar bin Khattab, secretly he follows Abu Bakr and he sees that he enters into a house. When he leaves, Umar bin Khattab, he enters his house. There's an old lady there, old lady. She's blind. She's got very young children. So some of the scholars say maybe they're her grandchildren, maybe they're orphans. So she's in the weakest of state. It's her house. Nothing's there. And, and, and Umar Khattab says, this man, he comes to your house. Do you know his name? No, I don't know his name. What does he do every day? She says, he comes. He cleans my entire house. He washes the clothes. He cooks the food. And when we are okay, he leaves us. She sa he says, does he do that every day? She says, yes, he does that every single day. Almost starts to cry. Yeah, this, is, this is, almost starts to cry. He says, Ya Abu Bakr, you have exhausted us. No one can compete with you, Ya Abu Bakr. 
Look, this is Abu Bakr. He is the Khalifa. Blind, old woman, small kid, every day. Washing, cleaning, make everything okay. And this is how the Khalifa, this is why Abu Bakr has such a rank. So the lesson, the small things, don't, don't, don't forget about the small. Maybe you're doing something, this was hidden. This was one of Abu Bakr's hidden deeds. Just because Omar saw how many other hidden deeds did Abu Bakr have that we will never know about. These were the greatest of the people. So we conclude and we close the khutbah that we try our hardest to follow the steps of the illustrious Sahaba of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. We gain knowledge. They are our leaders. They are our teachers. There's so much to learn of sadaqah, of da'wah, of ikhlaq and all these things. May Allah make us amongst those inshaAllah. Allahumma ighfulina dhanubana wa kafrina sayyatana. Allahumma qina adhab al dunya wa adhab al akhirah. اللهم اغفر للمؤمن مؤمنات والمسلمين مسلمات ربنا آتنا في الدنيا حسنة وفي الآخرة حسنة وقنا عذاب النار وعكم السلام